one was always teasing me when I finally found something I was good at and I received compliments. I wanted to have that all the time. It seemed as I grew up, it became so important to hear accolades and pats on my back. I never wanted to get in a rut of doing the same old, same old. I always wanted to impress people with what I could do. I started to hear people ooh and awe about my artwork and my talent creating art and furniture. I started out drawing, then painting. Then I started doing custom hand carving and ceramic greenware, of all things. And I started a business called Grand Muggers, Inc. We made cups for the Texco Haviland Grand Prix in Denver when they were here their first year. We designed and made lay cups and saucers for Port of France restaurants and cafes. I designed steins for the Denver Ranger hockey team when they first came to Denver as the New York Ranger farm team and designed and produced cups for POW MIA air show in Northern Colorado and designed cups for the Remax balloon festival when they first started in Colorado. We custom designed and carved cups for Vail Valley plates, other items that we sold in gifts and tourist stores. Our cup business started out all because I wanted a custom paramedic cup and nobody sold them. One time I decided I would carve it and I carved it with an exacto knife and I carved a one of a kind paramedic cup that had an ambulance on one side, the star of life on the other and the Hippocratic Oath came out really nice, had a lot of people that wanted them, but I had no idea how to mass produce something that I designed and hand carved. One day somebody stole the cup and so I had to carve another one. It took me 60 hours designing it, carving it, but this time I decided I needed to know how to make the mold so I could sell them. I did and I created all the molds and over a period of time, my wife and I had painted and fired thousands of Grand Mugger cups, actually in just a span of a few short years. Needless to say, my self-confidence at that point in time was up and running full steam. I realized I really enjoyed designing and carving, but production work was not my thing. I enjoyed painting detail work, but realized painting the exact same tedious detail on a hundred thousand cups felt like a prison sentence to me. Then after I produced cups for Port La France, there came a point where I mixed a custom glaze. I mixed this color and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and made several gallons of glaze. And I used it over and over as it ran out. I couldn't duplicate that cobalt blue color. And finally, at a certain point in time, I was out of the color and I had to tell them I could not duplicate it. And I was finished making cups for them. Denver Ranger hockey team after the first year or so, if I remember right, they went out of business. So we didn't sell any more cups after the first year, as did the Remax balloon festival. We did really well at the first festival. Actually, I think it rained and we sold a lot the first day, didn't sell a lot the second day. Texaco Haviland Grand Prix, that was quite a production. We put that on. It went very well, had a lot of people involved in it. Some people we had helping us glaze them, fire them, take care of it. We did really well, but then the Texaco Haviland Grand Prix went out of business as well. With all that going on and not really caring for the production work, I decided I wanted to apply my skills and talents doing custom commission hand carved wood creations instead. I went to work in Aspen, Vail, Steamboat Spring areas. Did a lot of custom newel posts, fireplace mantles, did a lot of different art. Doing these things led to a great personal interactions with people that made me feel needed and important. They loved my work. Everybody talked about it. They wanted to have me do their custom carving. It gave me a sense of being needed and accomplishment. I did it exceptionally well. Started carving custom log billiard tables for Grizzly Creek log builders. 
I custom designed several custom pieces for galleries in Steamboat Springs, Aspen and Vail. One time I applied, I was accepted into the Western Design Conference in Cody, Wyoming and displayed a custom wine table that I created. I put a lot of my artwork and a lot of my custom carvings in galleries and they always took approximately 50% of what the art sold for. I soon became disenchanted with working so many hours and splitting it with the galleries. I went to work as an operations manager for a company called Backyards Plus, and we built outdoor kitchens, pergolas, par three courses, water features, outdoor fireplaces, etc. Again, people made me feel valued and needed, and this incentive pushed me harder to go to the next level to impress people with guess what else I can do. I really enjoyed designing and building people's outdoor living room areas and was quite good at being able to paint a picture in their minds about what their living area would look like, sound like, and feel like. Outdoor living areas were popular when the economy was on top of its game, but when the economy started to tank, a lot of that was discretionary income and people didn't spend the money on it. It always seemed everything I did was for affluent folks that had a lot of discretionary income. What they actually really liked to do was ooh and ah, their family, friends, and clients. Grizzly Creek log builders built amazing log pool tables and delivered them all over the world to affluent and rich folks that had to have nothing but the very best. At one point in time, I custom carved a table for Roy Rogers' family did hand carving of a little golden record cover. Happy trails to you when a cowboy needs a horse. I carved Dale, Roy, Trigger, and Bullet. I always custom carved with chisels and a mallet. One time I did an old miner carrying a lantern appearing to be stepping up out of a cave into a huge cottonwood tree. I enjoyed working outside so much I decided to start a business designing and making water features after I went to school to learn how to do it. I built complete ecosystems and even went to school to learn how to build swimming pools, negative edge pools, pondless water features, rivers and streams and waterfalls. I designed and built a water wall in a hair salon, custom designed tables using exotic woods, making live edge countertop bars, wine barrel furniture, kitchen cabinets, islands, and anything totally unique came easily to me. One thing I do wanna point out None of this was really what I was doing for a living. I did this on the side. I'm sure you've all heard of the term jack of all trades, master of none. That described me to a T. Some of the things I did for a living, besides all that that I just mentioned, I did EMS education. I worked as an EMT for an ambulance company, worked as a phlebotomist. I was an EMT, I and paramedic taught EMS education at a local hospital, worked EMS for an ambulance company. I became an assistant trauma coordinator, worked with a medical flight team. I was in the United States Air Force. I drove a truck delivering fuel over the Rocky Mountains. I drove a truck for CR England, Western Distributing. I taught oil and gas employees for Halliburton, Slumberjay, Baker Hughes, and others how to drive commercial motor vehicles. At one point in time, I was the lead instructor for Center for Transportation Safety and had over 17 full-time instructors I managed. I became a third-party tester for the state of Colorado. I taught Arrive Alive at 25, going to schools and events with tractor, trailer, and classroom in the state-of-the-art simulator. We taught kids how to say no to alcohol and testing while driving. I even went back to the Air Force as a civilian trainer and trained Air Force drivers at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Minot Air Force Base, and F.B. Warren. I was then hired by Weatherford to build a commercial vehicle compliance program. Later on, I went to work for T-Force Energy as a DOT compliance manager, then became operations manager over Texas, Pennsylvania, and Colorado. I started my own oil and gas commercial CMV consulting company, consulting for Sp Express Energy Services, ALS Oil and Gas, Blackline Energy, and other companies, and eventually became a vice president of safety and DOT for a startup trucking company. I look at all this in a short period of time, what seems a short period of time in my life, 
I've done an awful lot. It sounds like I'm bragging about all the things I've done. And yet many of the things that I've done, I've done well, but I never became an expert at it. I love telling people and striving to become and do something else. I guess because there's some inadequacies and things that I have felt a failure at. So I do that to make myself look better when I tell people everything I do. Anymore, I don't even really like to tell people I've done so much because I know I'm going to hear, good grief, how in the world did you do all those things? As I look back, I realize I truly was a jack of all trades and master of none. I enjoyed art. I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed the medical field. I enjoyed consulting and operations. But what I really got from all of this was a sense of satisfaction and importance. I was looking for something that made me feel better about myself than what I really feel about myself deep down inside throughout those years. I no longer was a fat kid. I didn't wet the bed and people really seemed to like me and that made a difference in my life. Right now, currently, I am doing consulting and compliance, and I tell people I do consulting and build things in my shop. I do have a nice shop, a laser engraving machine, and now a CNC carving machine. I have a business called High Style NXS, CMC LLC, and Reflections in Time. As a veteran, I also have been given the opportunity to work with Joel Hunt at mbradio.us and I'm learning how to be a radio DJ, make podcasts and radio shows. Because I quit high school and never attended college, I've decided I really want to get some college in, and I am now taking some college classes online. I have a lot of things going on. People I know have asked me, how are you able to be so good at so many things? I do believe for the most part, these people that have indeed known me for years also know deep down inside I've failed in many ways in my life. When you start to realize you have areas where you just seem to fail constantly, do you ever overcompensate and work to steer people's attention back to areas you have developed confidence in? I know I certainly do, and I think that's what I've done most of my life. While I was trying to be the absolute best in all those things, I also was trying to be a husband and a father. And I never was very good at that. It wasn't because I didn't want to be. I just could never figure out when I was working 130 hours a week how to do it. It was another area I realized deep down inside. I'm a jack of all trades and master of none. Amateurs stop when they achieve something. Professionals understand that the initial achievement is just the beginning. Confession time. I love ha having everyone that sees my artwork and things I do tell me how fantastic they think it is. I guess I'm a look at me junkie, but I am probably deep down inside one of the most insecure guys you've ever known. I've become addicted to hearing how good I am and everything I do and if I do not hear it, I fear that I've lost my edge. And a lot of old, deep-rooted self-esteem issues I have so long repressed and buried come creeping up. If the truth be known, I watch people all the time with far greater artistic talent, more creativeness, better teachers. They manage people in a way I wish I knew how to do. I often sit and compare myself to what I believe is the very best in any given area, and I really start to feel... A lot of times, like at the age of 65, I failed. I catch myself looking at people that do similar things as I do. And, and at times, I start to compare our work. Mine with the attitude of, gee, look at how good this is. And theirs with, uh, well, that isn't as good as I do it. I then realize often these are friends, and I'm criticizing them because of my own deep-rooted self-confidence issues. I look back at failing in high school by quitting. I look back at failing in the Air Force by staying in no longer than I had to. Sure, I can build and design furniture, water features, and a plethora of other things, but there are individuals out there that can literally run circles around me. I hear less all the time about how great my work is, and I start to wonder if I've lost my edge. 
When friends or family tell me they really like something I've made, in the back of my mind, I wonder if they just say that to make me feel better about myself. Sometimes I wonder if when I give somebody close to me a custom piece of art, if they hang it in their house, or if they do, do they just do it when I'm going to be coming over and whenever I leave, they take it down? <laughs> Am I coming to an end of my unique talents and abilities? Am I now a buffalo singing the dinosaur blues? What gives me value in this world today? One area, as you can imagine, that has been extremely difficult for me is physical exercise. I'm not a guy that goes out and runs or bikes for miles a day, and I've always been very self-conscious about being overweight. I really don't remember too many people picking on me. It was just feeling like I was frumpy and dumpy, and I avoided situations that would shine the light on the fact I was not a desired physical specimen. I love to have always wanted a girlfriend, but I was never again. I stayed away from them because when I was younger, because of the same issues. So I always battled the battle. Most often I feel like I have proven to myself. I'm a good artist. I was a good medic. I was a good compliance and operations manager. I think I'm a good teacher and a good friend and a good eater. When I look in the mirror at my heart and my physical self, I see some areas I would say I'm not good at. And these areas do indeed haunt me. Number one is a father, number two, a husband, number three, an organizer, and number four, physique extraordinaire. So take a look as a father, as many of you know, I have a daughter that's a mess on alcohol, drugs. She's had terrible relationships has lived an extremely difficult life. And when I look in this mirror, I take credit for much of this. My son took his life. Again, I can't help but wrestle with feelings. I should have, could have, and would have done things differently. Working 130 hours a week and not being there when he was younger definitely had contributing things to that. With my stepson, stepdaughter, I failed. My marriage, my first marriage, I failed miserably. Even my relationship with my nephews and my brother, it's been tenuous and strained and I failed at that. I've had others in my life, I have failed to be the man I ought to have been and have hurt them deeply. When I'm looking in that mirror, I can look at myself and I see myself on a score in life of being not much. I hear people say, you can't blame yourself for all of that. And I do appreciate it when they tell me that. But one thing I've learned is that when things keep going wrong, sometimes you need to look at the common denominator and that's me. So in life, how would I score? It's funny how we always seem to be trying to compensate for an inadequacy we have in our life by excelling in other areas that come easy to us. I think it's a way of self-preservation. When somebody says, hey, aren't you that guy that couldn't make your marriage work? Or aren't your kids the ones that don't want anything to do with you? I guess I would much rather be known as a great artist or a teacher. It hides a lot of that pain from the other. I'd rather people focus on things that distract them from seeing areas in my life that haunt me and make me cringe inside. I believe in time, many of us have walked so often in front of the mirror that on occasion we happen to stop and see who we really are or who we think we see. Remember what we discussed last week? Jesus has a loving but firm way of holding a mirror up before us so we can see the truth. I think Satan has a way of holding a mirror up that deceives us and leads us to total disappointment. We get down on ourselves and we're in pain. He loves to have us at that point. I know I can't blame myself for everything, but in my heart, deep down inside, I can see what I really have been responsible for. As I look deeper and deeper, I push myself further into the darkness of self-loathing, pity, and despair. Which mirror am I looking at? I try to make myself better through deception and deflection. If I can get everybody to focus on what I really want them to see, if I can change their attitude about this and not let them concentrate on that, 
I know if I can see the flaws in my character, others can surely see it as well. I found an article by Pastor Glenn Mills out of Pennsylvania, and he said, unhealthy introspection is a daily threat to our joy in Christ. Many of us tend to examine ourselves in a way that is excessive, inaccurate, and leads to discouragement. Can you hear yourself saying, I'm failing at everything? I don't like the way God made me. The Lord is not helping me. My service is worthless. My gifting is useless. My growth is hopeless. Self-examining spiritual depression speaks a thousand lies. The gospel speaks a better word. When self-examination is evil, God calls us to examine ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Lamentations 340, let's examine and search our, out our ways, and let's return to the Lord. Healthy examination is a difficult and dangerous duty. The flesh seizes self-examination as an opportunity to turn our thoughts against us. Introspection is deceptive because it often looks like we're doing the right thing. We're not indifferent to our sin. We want to seek it out. But when that introspection makes us self-absorbed instead of Christ-absorbed, we undermine our faith. Charles Spurgeon once said, any practice that detracts from faith is an evil practice, but especially that kind of self-examination which would take us away from the foot of the cross proceeds in a wrong direction. I am familiar with this evil, the self-examination that lessens faith and leads away from the foot of the cross. Thomas Chalmers, a Scottish church leader in the 19th century, knew that self-examination can be tiring and fruitless. He once compared self-examination to a dark room full of objects. We can see what we can't see what's in there because the room is pitch black. This darkness is the reason looking at ourselves is often so unfruitful. How do we brighten that room? not by straining our eyes or taking more time and effort to examine the darkness. We will never see ourselves clearly simply by focusing more intently on ourselves. Instead, Chalmers says we must go to the window and open the curtains. Let the light of Christ break into the darkness of our souls. The sunlight in Chalmers' image is the truth of God's word. He states, if we derive no good from the work of self-examination because we find that all is confusion and mistiness within, then let us go forth upon the truths which are without, and these will pour a flood of light into all the mazes and intricacies of the soul, and at length render that work easy, which before was impractical. If you are currently lost in the maze of introspective concerns, aware of the confusion and chaos within, and burdened by renegade self-reflection, the best thing you can do is soak up the sunshine of God's truth. Go to the Word, hear the voice of the Lord, and experience the flood of divine light pouring into your mind with clarity and comfort. The sunlight of the gospel of grace provides the necessary atmosphere for healthy self-examination. Let's look at the mirror Christ is holding up for us to see. Let's soak in gospel sunlight. So when we go to God's word, what light does the gospel shed on the darkness of self-examination? The gospel brings proportion to our examination. As we learn to treasure Christ, we will spend far more time looking to Christ than to ourselves. We learn that we are not changed by beholding self, but by beholding Christ, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Robert Murray McChaney famously said, for every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. The gospel brings pardon to our examination. God knows the worst about you and loves you still. He does not deal with us according to our sins, Psalms 103.10. And he promises that if we confess our sins, he will forgive us and cleanse us. 1 John 1, 9. Only when we are secure in the love of God for us in Christ are we empowered for self-examination, 
that is now humble, confident, and fruitful. The gospel brings perception to our examination. The most important thing we need to know about ourselves are not found by looking inward, but by looking to Christ. In his death, resurrection, our identity comes into focus. We see how precious and honored we are in God's sight, the seriousness of our sin, the glory of our new identity, and the future we have in Christ. No longer are we just beating ourselves up for a pointless reason to desecrate ourselves and destroy ourselves. It's to build us up. It's to have us be who Christ wants us to be. The gospel brings power to our examination. God knows the worst about you and loves you still. Grace transforms examination from a tyrant and a burden into a means of faith, love, and hope. Self-examination doesn't have to be buckets of water thrown on the fires of our faith. Instead, it can be fuel. We can see where power is at work in us, and we can move forward with the confidence of knowing that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. Philippians 1.6 I have come to realize that I tried without hope to become something I was not. Do you compare yourself to others and find they seem to have so much to offer that if you could only be half as good as them, you would feel good about who you are? Do you struggle with sin in the past and when you reflect, start to convince yourself that if people see the real me, they will be repulsed? Do we really start to make ourselves believe that by good work, we can make up for all the bad we used to do? Is the gospel informing your self-reflection? Always look up before looking in. Never leave the foot of the cross. Welcome the sunlight and watch the darkness scatter. What's been so eye-opening to me lately is that I can get good at many, many things worldly. I can appear to be just about anything, and I can convince myself I'm great at all sorts of things. I start to live in my own little world. I can brag on Facebook about my skills. I can drop my name with the best of them. I can start to make others look small because I feel small. I can do this and I can do that. When I'm doing this, who am I focused on, really? The great deceiver loves this when we do it. Not only are we focused on ourselves, but in a way, We become successful. Everyone else is as well. They probably are not thinking about how wonderful I am, like I think I am. They're probably thinking, what a clown this arrogant guy is. Or this guy really thinks he's something. Wait a minute. Isn't this the guy that goes to True Life Church? When Satan gets us thinking about ourselves, who are we not focused on? Scripture tells us when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom, Proverbs 11, 2. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate, Proverbs 8, 13. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight, Romans 12, 16. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance for on the, or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees man, looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. For Samuel 16, 7. What filter must we direct the word a truth through so that we can see ourselves through Christ's eyes? Is it through the thoughts and perceptions of human acceptance? Or is it through the filter of self-worth and works? Charles Spurgeon said in the Metropolitan Tabernacle pulpit, If you meet with a system of theology which magnifies man, flee from it as fast as you can. Here is a test for you to apply, and by it you may tell whether a thing is true or not. Does it glorify God? Then accept it. If it does not, if it glorifies man, If it puts human will, human ability, human merit into the place of the mercy and the grace of God, away with it, for it is not food fit for your souls to feed upon.
As most of you know, I started attending a new church, True Life Church. Pastor Bob Hillier has been the pastor there for several minutes, and I'm growing to appreciate him more and more. The other night, they put on a dinner for veterans at National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day, and they were looking for people to volunteer with setting up tables, preparing food, meeting and greeting, cleaning up, etc. Really, for one of the first times in my life, I didn't want to go as a veteran. I didn't want to go as a great artist. I really wanted to just go and open the door and say hello to the veterans as they came in, to shake their hand and listen to them. Then wait on the tables, move the chairs and tables, and vacuum the floor. I think not very often I have a servant's heart. I felt like I had a servant's heart at that point in time. I want to do that more. I have two families that have adopted us. What an awesome blessing to be loved, accepted, and cherished as part of these beautiful families. Sometimes the urge is to reflect and think how absolutely undeserving I am to be loved so much. Again, I start looking in that other mirror. Christ is the ultimate example of true acceptance, forgiveness, compassion, and love. When he's holding up the mirror, I do not have to compensate any longer for things I've done in my life I am so ashamed of. I have confessed those, and he has forgotten those sins as far as the east is to the west. I could degrade myself and rob myself of a newfound family of all the love and joy I have as a new creation in Christ, but that's not what he created me for. That's not what he saved me from. And that's not who I am in my position with him. I'm a new creation. Am I good at everything? No, but I am perfect in Christ. And that is what truly matters. I am an ambassador saved through his love, mercy, and grace. As his children, how can we be anything but perfect? I challenge each of us to examine ourselves and our reasons for why we do things. Are we concerned about how we appear to others or are we concerned about how they see Christ in our daily walk? Do I do everything to glorify Jesus Christ because he's my King, my Savior, and my God? Do I have uncontrollable joy knowing that while I was yet still dead in my trespasses and sin, Christ came and died for me to atone for those sins? and has a place for me by his side awaiting in heaven? Do we truly love our family and friends? And are we unashamed to proclaim God's mercy and love so that they also may experience his unfathomable eternal love? The greatest gift God gave us was Jesus. As we go into this Christmas season, let's stay focused on the most excellent and perfect gift ever given to us. And let's bow before the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, I start to dissect my life and find all the pain, evil, and hate that has at some point in time been a part of my life, and most often I never weighed the cost. Fear and doubt, inner reflection creeps in, and I start to see myself as so unworthy and unforgivable. I fail to remember your perfect gift your son that you sent to walk on earth as a man, to take on all the sins of mankind, including mine, and carry them to Calvary with that cross, to be crucified and murdered for me. You took all those sins to the depth of hell and rose again, making me a new creation in you, perfect and forgiven. As we go into this Christmas season, please show me the opportunities to be a witness and a testimony for you. And teach me always to be that new creation, the man you want me to be in you. Teach me to see the joy in being that new creation and that there is nothing I ever need to do to prove my value. I am a child of the King. As I strive to be better, make it because I want to be better for you. If I want to learn new things, give me the desire to learn new things so that I might glorify you. Lord, I ask you to change my vision. Change it to see you, the world, and myself through your eyes. I ask that you protect our military. Lord, keep them and their families safe and secure in the palm of your hand. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, Savior, and King.
saw the sun begin to dim. I felt that winter wind blow cold. A man learns who's there for him. And the glitter fades and the walls won't hold. Cause from then rubble, what remains can only be what's true. If all was lost, it's more I gained, cause it led me back to you. And from now on, these eyes will not be blinded by the light. From now on, what's waited till tomorrow starts tonight? Tonight, and let this promise in me start like an anthem in my heart. From now on. 